Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this MHPN webinar on an interdisciplinary approach to caring for people living with obsessive compulsive disorder. We've got a fascinating case to consider tonight and a great panel to do it with. And as always, we're looking to you for your questions that you've asked before the webinar, but also during the webinar, uh, so that the panel can respond to those. I will begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia on which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We do pay our respects to elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture, hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. We currently have uh, roughly, what are we, um, over 500 people already connected and uh, others still joining us. So it's a, a good number for what should be a really good evening. My name's Steve Trumbull and I'll be the facilitator tonight. I'm a general practitioner by training, but my major role is as head of medical education at the University of Melbourne, Melbourne Medical School. We just graduated another 360 brand new doctors today, so that's good news. Um, I will apologize for my background. You probably notice it's a virulent green. The chroma key is not working. There is a storm over Melbourne at the moment for those of us who are in Melbourne. So if the power goes out, talk amongst yourselves until we rejoin you. But uh, hopefully things will hold in. Uh, the, the team's done a wonderful job bringing it all together again. Um, the Panelist biographies were disseminated with the webinar invitations, so I won't go through those in detail, but I will just say a quick hello to each of the members, starting in the order of the presentations we'll be hearing with Dr. Scott Blair West, who I first met 36 years ago. <laughs> hello, Scott. You're Hi, a Steve. <laughs> That's ages as both. You're a psychiatrist here in Victoria, and the question I'm going to ask you is obviously about obsessive compulsive disorder. What's the prevalence of the condition and have you found it increasing significantly during the pandemic? Uh, thanks, Steve. Thanks for everyone for inviting me. Um, look, the, the general stats for OCD uh, have been done in a whole range of countries across the world, suggest that prevalence is about 2%, a bit more, a bit less. Um, as to whether it's increased, um, no one really knows, I've got to say. I think the general feeling of people who work in the area is perhaps it is, but then this might relate to all anxiety disorders. Um, and certainly presentations this year seem to be up. Um, interestingly, not so much last year perhaps, um, when people sort of, I think, stayed at home and sort of snuggled down, and but they're all coming out now, maybe can't um, manage things quite so well. Um, so yeah, I, could we, we, we could be seeing more. Um, we're certainly seeing more people with with related disorders too, skin picking, hair pulling, that sort of stuff as well. Mm. Um, so we'll wait to see. There's going to be a lot of research on this subsequently, I'm sure. Absolutely. And we, I'm sure we'll discuss it when we get to the questions. There have been a number of questions about people's return to workplaces and schools and the impact of the hand washing uh, regimens, the hand hygiene regimens, and whether that's uh, driving people's behaviours. So great to have you, Scott. Good to see you. Uh, the Thank next you. person I'll introduce you to is Dr. Celine uh, Gilgich, who is a clinical psychologist. Now, you're also enjoying the delights of Victoria at the moment, Celine. Welcome to the, the webinar. And the question I'm going to ask you, I must say I'm genuinely curious about this, what interested mm -hmm. you so much about obsessive compulsive disorder that you decided to make this aspect of mental health care the focus of your career? Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, what interested me in working with OCD was while I was a student uh, working with Scott and his team at the inpatient program at the Melbourne Clinic um, on my final clinical placement. Um, I very quickly realised that there wasn't a lot of advocacy for people with OCD in Australia. It wasn't very well known. There were a lot of gaps in people's knowledge. It wasn't that very well understood. And so what sparked that passion in me was not only enjoying working with the clinical population and, um, you know, and I was very lucky to be supported by such an amazing team and learnt so much. Um, the other thing that sparked that, ignited that passion was wanting to be able to do more in that area and seeing that gap. Um, so I think it was a bit of t a really good timing to be able to um, be in such a position at the end of my clinical placement um, all those years ago, not 36 years ago, <laughs> but 
but 11 years ago. <laughs> um, so it's, um, it was, yeah, it was really, really eye opening for me. And that's something that hasn't died down all these years later. Yeah. Fantastic. It's a joy to have something that you're truly passionate about to drive you uh, at work every day. So that's fabulous. Now, Johanna Lynch, you very wisely live in Queensland. Well done. Well done, you. Um, and you, like me, are a general practitioner. Uh, what the hell are you doing as a GP? You're going out and doing a PhD. What what drove you to be so interested in a question that you've undertaken a PhD in it? Uh, I think it's actually been driven by my patients who I saw cycling in and out of the mental health system uh, where as a GP I wanted to work out how to hold them a little bit more as a whole person and um, I saw their life stories and their relationships kind of sidelined in how we thought about them when we were thinking about their mental well-being and uh, so that drove me back um, influenced a lot by what I'd learned in trauma and attachment and through my patients life stories uh, their compulsions and their addictions and the patterns that I saw in those uh, that led me back to, to try and see if there was a wider pattern we could use to help GPs and other clinicians to see the whole person. Fantastic. And so that's really very much the thrust of your approach to practice, the whole person. That's right. I, I kind of think that's a special thing that um, GPs do in their day-to-day -day work that they don't even notice that they do and that it can be a gift to the whole system if we were better able to articulate what we do. Fantastic. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you for being with us tonight. And we will definitely get to hear more about that uh, during the presentation and the discussion. Uh, what I want to do now is introduce the uh, participants to the webinar platform. I see a number of familiar names in the, the list of people who've been with us before, but I'll quickly, quickly take you through it. Most of the navigation uh, buttons that you need are located at the top right of your screen. So there you can use the purple button to access the chat box. So please chat with each other uh, in the chat box and we'll keep an eye on that. If anything comes up that we need to address, we'll certainly do that. If you have a more formal question though, please use the blue hand button to enter your question and then that will come through to the panelists. And if we can get to it, we certainly will. You can download the slides and other resources that the panelists have contributed tonight by the light blue button. Uh, which is there with the little down arrow on it. Um, the, there's a help button, which is always good news. Uh, if you need assistance, you can message Redback, the conference providers directly, or um, ring the number, uh, which um, I think might be there. No, it's not. That's okay. Uh, if anybody's anxious, you can write the number down, 1-800-733-416. So what we'll be doing is we'll be moving on to the presentation in just a moment. Um, each panellist will give a brief presentation, which is specific to their particular discipline, followed by questions and answers between the panel. And we're very much going to aim at these learning outcomes, which you can see there. And mainly it's looking at the biological and environmental factors that increase the risk of developing OCD, along with other comorbidities. Uh, we'll discuss the assessment, diagnosis and treatment We'll particularly talk about those treatments which are successful, as you would hope, when treating OCD. But also, as always, we want to talk about the importance of collaboration and making appropriate referrals when providing care to people who live with um, obsessive compulsive disorder. So you will have already seen the um, case study that's been circulated uh, relating to Dewata, our patient or client. Uh, and there's quite a lot going on in her life. Uh, she has got to the point, though, where she's betwixt and between as far as the provision of her uh, mental health care is concerned, and she's anxious about moving on to a new provider of mental health care because she's moved geographically within the state. So we're going to start, actually, with her psychiatrist, the person who's been more or less a consistent theme through her life. She doesn't see the psychiatrist very often, but the psychiatrist has probably got the best overview of uh, Dewata's case at the moment. So that's you, Scott Blair West. You're the psychiatrist oh, yeah. this evening. So if you could take us through your approach to dealing with Dewata's needs. 
Great. Um, look, thanks, Steve. Um, so, look, my first thought is, so I'm going to talk about sort of um, initial ideas, um, a little bit about the model that we use, um, and then a bit about the more um, medical psychiatric treatments. Um, and my colleagues are going to touch on more of the psychological side of thing. Um, and I'll make a few comments about all of those sort of things as we go. So, look, my first thought is we need to we need to make a diagnosis first, um, which you might think is pretty clear cut in this case, um, but it's not always so. So um, in Duarte's case, it, it, there's lots of concern about contamination, um, lots of excessive um, uh, washing and hand washing, etc. Um, so this is what I've what I've put, given you here is um, a way of sort of making a diagnosis of OCD in this case, but also in others. So we need um, recurrent anxiety provoking thoughts, images and urges seen as intrusive, involuntary, exaggerated, excessive and against one's own belief system. Um, most OCD people have intrusive thoughts. Um, a few people have intrusive images as well, um, particularly people with violent content. So this is people who fear they're going to harm others. Um, and sometimes people who have intrusive sexual co content as well. Um, I always think diagnosis really should be focused on the the obsessions, the thoughts and the images. So secondly, we, we have repeated compulsive behaviours, pretty obvious in this case, not always obvious. Um, and in the, the latter, the latter um, comments there, I've, I've given you some of the particular content. So... Um, the content of obsessions, contamination, disaster, violent thoughts um, relating to doubt, fear of loss, sexual intrusion, religious OCD. Um, and we also see people now who have issues with their relationships in the sense that they have thoughts, I'm not sure I love that person or equally and vice versa, I'm not sure they love me. Um, and then the, the list of compulsions that, are, that, that tend to go with those things as well. The thing, the point I wanted to make at the end here is that we see a lot of people now doing compulsions in their head. So um, don't assume that someone doesn't have OCD if they don't do a, a physical compulsion. This is really important. And in fact, often as people get a bit older, they tend to do things more in their head than they do physically. So let me go on. All right, so this is my first step in, 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 in helping people understand and trying to, to help the, the treatment process get started. So this is the model that, that I use and a lot of people do use. Um, starts with uh, triggers, things that start off the process. So for her, it'll be touching things uh, in most cases and she will have an intrusive thought in response to that. Um, what if I'm contaminated? In some cases, it might even be I f just feel dirty. Um, we have then, so that's an intrusive thought that just pops into the person's head. The appraisal is how they appraise that thought. And characteristically, OCD people give a lot of meaning to those thoughts. Now, you might have these thoughts, but you might give them short shrift. You might sort of be able to push them to one side and not respond. For her, she'll be thinking probably one of two ways. One is, this is um, terrible, I'm going to get contaminated, I'm going to harm other people by spreading contamination. Alternately, she might just dislike the feeling of being contaminated. That's the feeling of being disgusted in that sense. Um, and that will lead to anxiety, shame, guilt, and then the compulsive behaviours, which in this case involve washing and cleaning. So this is, our, this is one of the first steps in the, the process. Um, and so as I've said there, the treatment options are listed there. Now, I, will, I should apologise, they're definitely in the wrong order. Um, the first one is correct. We start with education, we start with talking about OCD, we hopefully develop that model. Um, but really, ERP should be well above drugs. Um, and we should be trying to approach people with psychological approaches like exposure and response prevention before um, we use medication. There'll be some people where it'll only work with medication and we need to, do the, we need to use the pills first off, um, mainly people who are se severely unwell or significantly depressed. 
So the top three are the, 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 are the gist of, of pretty much all OCD treatments. We can sometimes add in some cognitive therapy. Um, that's a fairly specific approach that I think Celine might talk a touch about. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about augmentation and combination medication strategies and we can touch on the novel therapies later on if we have a bit of time in questions. So, all right, so medications. Now, I've got to say up front, um, there have been no breakthroughs really here in the last sort of 20, 30 years, really since the introduction of the serotonergic antidepressants. Um, and my jargon there, SSRI stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor antidepressants. Um, SNRIs are another variety of those. Um, and CMI is clomipramine, which is the only tricyclic antidepressant that works. And that's pretty much the order that we do it in. Um, we will subsequently, in some cases, add um, augmentation with other drugs. And I've listed the three sort of areas that we might use there. 5-HT is serotonergic drugs. Um, DA is dopaminergic drugs. Uh, GLU is glutamatergic drugs. Now, these drugs sometimes have some benefit. The most useful ones really are the dopaminergic ones. These are drugs that are used or have been developed for psychosis, um, but in very small doses we find that they, they can be quite good as augmenting drugs for SSRIs. I would normally only use these when we're getting a bit of response from the SSRIs or the, the, the first medication, but we're not really getting enough. Um, and we want to see if we can boost it a touch. I'm getting a, the bell here. I've got, I've got one to go, so I'll continue on to that. So, look, finally, these are the comorbidities, and this is just a point to make. Comorbidity is common. You, you should almost assume comorbidity, um, and certainly I suspect Duarte has had issues with depression in the past. I wouldn't be at all surprised if she has issues with social anxiety and generalised anxiety as well, but there's a range of other um, conditions and, and um uh, symptoms that, that are also relevant there as well. Um, and as I said, you must consider that sort of stuff. Social anxiety is the thing I'd be, be, be asking you to consider mostly. Um, so that's it for me, Steve. I'll hand back to you. Great. Thanks very much indeed, Scott. And there's certainly plenty that we'll discuss in the, uh, in the, the chat part later on. So thanks for leading us into it. But we now will move on to looking at it from Celine's point of view. So Celine, you've seen in the case study where um, she's really quite anxious about finding or starting up with another psychologist. Mm -hmm. However, she's being referred to you. So uh, let's hear your approach. Thank you so much. Um, so when a client like Dewada comes to see me, it's really not unusual that she would have worked with someone before or is often referred by a psychiatrist um, or a GP um, and in those instances really what we want to do and, and so when a, I guess when a client comes to see us quite often a diagnosis is made sometimes though a diagnosis is unclear because a client will come with a more general um, diagnosis such as query anxiety or depression but seeing as we're talking about Jawada and she's already had her diagnosis I won't um, during that first session really it's about getting to know her and really understanding her as a person but also understanding the function of her OCD um, symptoms and what that does for her. So the first thing we focus on as clinical psychologists is really formulating our client and what that means is understanding some of these things that we've got listed here such as what was Duarte's particular vulnerability to developing OCD and we consider things like genetic history, um, family history, family dynamics, um, her relationship with um, her family growing up, etc. cetera. Um, what are the origins of her OCD behavior? So what, what were some of the first things she noticed right back at the beginning? What was going on for her at the time? What are the current problem areas? What is her OCD narrative? So that's the other thing we wanna know in terms of current problem behaviors or areas in terms of what is what is the OCD saying to her in a sense, um, for lack of a better way of describing it, um, that's perpetuating her symptoms. What are her supports? We also want to know because people are not, they don't exist on their own, they live in a system. And I think Johanna's going to explore this a little bit more later. 
um, in terms of who is her support, who does she have as professionals, who in her family is there to help her rather than enable her, um, and then using all of that information to formulate a treatment plan. And as Scott talked about, the gold standard treatment that we use is exposure and response prevention. I myself don't err on the side of cognitive therapy per se from a traditional CBT perspective. Um, if we think about cognitive behaviour therapy, traditionally what we tend to do is teach people um, uh, ways to reframe um, their intrusive thoughts and their faulty beliefs or the assumptions that they're making. We teach people to look for evidence and so on and so forth. But what we find with people with OCD is a lot of the time uh, when we try and reframe in that way, clients will often say, yeah, but I know it doesn't make sense. I know th that this is really unlikely. But when I'm in that moment of doubt, I just can't help it. And so doubt is a really, really big feature of anxiety in people with OCD. And if we think about how the brain works and we think about that fight, flight, freeze response when people are feeling anxious and we have... Um, frontal lobes being shut down because the amygdala is taking over, um, people become really reactive. And so what we see is this process here. So we see this process of the person being triggered, they're making an assumption. So this is very similar to what Scott talked about earlier. But what happens is they become extremely reactive. Their frontal lobe is shutting down. And as we know, our frontal lobes are responsible for things like reason, reasoning, logical thinking and all that kind of stuff. And so people can't access it in that moment in time and their behaviour becomes quite reactive, which is what we see in obsessions and um, in, sorry, in compulsions. Um, so what we want to do in treatment through exposure and response prevention is encourage people to be aware of what their triggers are. So we explore that together. And typically we use, through, the exposure, through exposure therapy, we use a graded hierarchy. So basically it's a step ladder from least anxiety provoking to most anxiety provoking triggers. And we start somewhere at the bottom and we teach people how to tolerate distress and discomfort because it becomes about, uh, our aim is to teach our client how to regulate their emotions because a lot of the recent research is showing us with people with OCD that it's not necessarily a thought problem. It's not about the content of their thinking. It's about the way that they're not regulating their emotions and using compulsions in a maladaptive way to help regulate the emotion. So we're conceptualizing it more now as an emotion regulation difficulty rather than a thought-based problem. So um, obsessions are really important from a diagnostic perspective, but from a treatment perspective, we really want to focus on emotion and emotion regulation and teaching people how to tolerate that distress, how to sit with their discomfort, how to really be open to their thoughts and feelings so that they can then be in control to resist their, um, their compulsions and slowly take those away. Um, and through that process, people learn that their feared consequence doesn't happen. So the evidence is gained kind of at the end, but it's our role as clinicians to really hold our clients so that they can sit through that process of learning how to ride that intense wave of emotion. It's like um, surfing the urge to scratch an itch, really, um, which is a lot more complex, obviously, in people with OCD. Um, but it's learning how to sit with that and giving themselves a chance to see that if they can ride that wave of emotion, the thought is just a thought at the end of the day. Um, one of the biggest no-nos is reassuring our clients or enabling our clients. And so I think just kind of coming back to Joada and her case, the other thing that you might want to consider um, is working on and looking at whether the family is accommodating her behaviour and addressing some of those as well. So just kind of thinking about how to, you know, the function of her OCD, um, how that's impacting her, teaching her how to regulate her distress so she's not relying on compulsions looking at how she can build her own independence with that, but also looking at how her family can support her in a way that isn't enabling. Okay, I think that's it from me. <laughs> There've certainly been some questions about the role of family and how family can support 
Um, mm. And also there's been a question about what you said about hierarchy within treatment. You mean you have things stacked up, I guess, that people can go for whichever yeah. shelf they need to, depending on how that... Yeah. It must be an extraordinary feeling for people who are riding that wave. Oh, it's it's amazing. It's a roller coaster. Like it's so scary at the start, but when they allow themselves to kind of get to the end of that wave, it's incredibly rewarding. Okay, well, that's yeah. great to know. Thanks for that. Uh, so then, the general practitioner role, and uh, we'll go to you now. Thanks, Johanna. If you could tell us a bit about your perspective from a whole person understanding. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Uh, I thought I'd start a little bit with a really insightful comment that Duarte said about herself, saying, I feel like an addict and I have to clean to calm my feelings of distress. And as, as a GP, I think that noticing what she thinks about her problem is a key uh, element of that initial connection with her so that we're with her um, and trying to see it from her point of view. And I guess then my, I see my task as trying to help understand what is this thing that she's calling distress and how wide is it involved in her life and to keep myself holding a really wide view while she um, has turned into having a very narrow view on certain things and really focusing her attention on this feeling of not wanting to uh, get contaminated or not wanting to hurt someone uh, when she thinks about her grandson. Um, and her parents. So I guess my, my sense is of Duarte is I can see somebody who's very thoughtful, very caring towards her uh, people in her life and uh, quite uh, focused and kind of highly values noticing and predicting and trying to prevent bad things happening. And all of those are lovely things about her and quite sophisticated, thoughtful things about her that I would want to help her see rather than uh, seeing herself as though something's shameful or wrong with her. And then if I look at this framework, my, my goal is to try and notice things in her environment that would increase or decrease her distress, uh, things in the social climate around her, uh, as well as in her personal relationships with the people that we've heard about in the story with her parents, um, with her husband, um, and with her sons and grandson. Uh, and I guess I'd also be very interested as a GP in her body and wanting to notice if there's anything uh, that might be increasing her sense of uh, emotional dysregulation in her body. Uh, and that would include some practical things like her, her thyroid and uh, her nutrition and um, the amount of time she spends in the sunlight and exercise and those kind of practical things that are part of seeing her. Uh, and then I'd be interested in her inner experience, which is where a lot of um, our conversation has been about today and the sorts of things that bother her inside, um, that she has memories and thoughts and images um, and, uh, and physical feelings that bother her and um, influence her life. And I'm also really interested in her sense of self and how much um, these symptoms that she's had have become a part of how she sees herself in the world and if, if there's anything, we can help her to have a more settled sense of who she is in the world, including how she sees her kind of spiritual world or meaning and belief system. Uh, I um, have a little framework to think through this. And in Dewata's case, I'm really interested. She's a migrant. She might have um, people in other parts of the world that she's worrying about or thinking about or missing, especially during covid uh, and um, we're noticing her her experience with um, just the, 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 what we're all experiencing through this time in COVID of an increased awareness of um, uh, germs and other people's influence on our well-being and um, even how, how much freedom we have to move, changing how we feel in the world. Uh, and then really interested in the quality of her relationship. So I'd be interested in how she's getting on with her husband how she feels when she goes to visit her parents, how much uh, stress she feels when she's being a grandmother, and uh, all, all those um, ex experiences as she travels through this journey. And again, um, in this case, she talks a lot about sensations at the beginning of her OCD journey, the experience of wound dressing and blood and gore that really kind of triggered off this. And so I'd be really noticing how Duarte experiences her sensations and whether she has a capacity to see a wider view of herself 
um, and whether or not there's a, a sense of um, being able to calm herself. And if there's any skills she already has from her previous psychologists, I'd be interested to connect to those. Uh, and again, noticing how she um, can, a, can sort of sense herself in the world or a big part of this journey. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is I noticed she's also had past therapists and she's fearful of future pet therapists. And so those relationships are also part of what might be distressing her at the moment. So if we look for resources, we're trying to find safety and help Dewada feel safer in the world and help that to help her body feel safer, which in turn will do what Celine has been talking us through around emotion regulation. So we want to reconnect her to her strengths, past hobbies, um, friendship groups she hasn't seen for a long time because of COVID, um, connect to somebody she hasn't talked to for a long time in her uh, overseas life or um, somebody she forgot in, that was a real resource to her in her past um, story and draw on those helpful relationships and memories and activate her connections to herself and to others and to the wider world, including um, just enjoying being in her own home, finding a chair in her house that she feels really comfortable in, enjoying being in her gardens, slowing down how she sees the world when she's going at the pace of her grandchild. And then a key piece, which I think we would all agree in this, is to build her capacity for, for soothing her, her own physiology and her capacity to tolerate the uncertainty of emotions as they rise and fall in her body. And uh, that will be a key area. As a GP, we can teach simple grounding skills that can become a resource throughout a person's life. Help her see her own patterns that help her to feel safe in the world and uh, uh, sort of assure her of um, staying with her on the journey as she engages with this task. And in, in Duarte's case, if I, uh, she's having trouble engaging with a GP clinic at the moment, what I would be hoping we could do is help Jeff to get her an online appointment as a first point of call to build towards her being able to come into the clinic uh, and to um, help her know that she's going to have some regular appointments with you where she doesn't have to be unwell to come, but she's got regular connection that will keep that engagement going. I have a framework that kind of thinks this through based on trauma-informed practice as a strength-based framework, and that our goal is to build Duwada's sense of safety overall. That's, that's a kind of wide framework, and to help her to grieve some of the things that really distress her um, in her current life and in the past and to help her have that sense that she's safe enough to grow, safe enough to learn new ways to calm herself, safe enough to learn um, new things in the world that take her attention away from the things that are currently her attention's focused on, safe enough to move from where she's currently feeling a bit stuck. And then uh, uh, a reframing of Maslow that was part of my thesis is saying that Duwada has some a uh, range of different needs, but if we think centrally, it's that we want her to have a calm body. Emotions are bodily experiences. They're a way our body talks to us and explains the world to us through our senses. And um, sometimes we don't know how to interpret that. We don't know how to understand that. And especially when we're aroused or hypervigilant, we are extra good at noticing every small change in our world around us. And so helping Duwata learn how to decrease her vigilance in, in the world she is, is a big part of the journey. And then I'd say we've, she's got a deep need to... ...safe, that she's not going to hurt them by being herself. And uh, that's, a, that's a, a need I would see for her as grandma. And safe on the inside from the, the harassing of thoughts and images and um, I guess senses that she's uh, worried by. Uh, that's a key goal for Duarte's well-being long term. And then that sense of her living somewhere where she feels safe to be. And at the moment, there's a bit of stress with her parents. And so, and, and whether to go and clean and the pressure of that and the stress of COVID and normalizing that a little bit, that the whole community is feeling this pressure that she has and it's not something specially wrong with her at the moment uh, that is part of this journey. And of course, always having this sense that she, like everyone else, can learn to cope with the things that our lives give us um, and that there's a, a growth that's possible for her 
that comes from a sense of being safe in the world. So that's it from me, Steve. Over to you. Thanks, Johanna, and thank you all. I think you've given fabulous presentations with a lot of compassion and recognition of the needs of the person with the condition. Um, although I think that really the, the thunder's been stolen a little bit in the chat box by Amanda, who uh, has written in the public chat about her own experiences of being diagnosed with OCD as a youngster, and the fact that CBT didn't help, and that to hear Euseline say that uh, it's all about emotional regulation, all about being with the condition and um, riding the condition rather than necessarily um, wrestling it into the ground. And there have also been questions about whether we go back to the causes of this. Uh, did you want to speak a little bit further on that? I'm so glad to hear that that was a breath of fresh air because I think a lot, like that is whenever, every time I sit with a client and go through that, that is without a doubt every single time that is a comment that every single client makes so i'm glad that that resonated with you as well um we do in a sense it does help to understand and kind of go back to to the why and i think not from and i know it sounds like probably like a very psychologisty thing to say like we want to kind of go back to childhood or teenagers or whatever that might be but I think the reason for that is because quite often, but not always, and I think Scott might be able to hope, maybe agree with or disagree with this as well, but we'll see what he says, um, in a sense that when a lot of the time when our things are going on in our environment, what happens is um, sometimes we can feel a bit out of control or we can feel overwhelmed and we start to try and... Um, we start to have this desire to want to feel better because no one likes feeling distressed or uncomfortable. And so we start to experience sometimes when we're really, really stressed or distressed or overwhelmed, we, for some people who have a predisposition can start to experience intrusive thoughts more often than those in the general population because intrusive thoughts are a part of everyone's thinking. They're actually quite normal to experience. What's not regular is the intensity and frequency at which someone with OCD experiences them. So we have a naturally occurring phenomena that starts to occur more often in people with OCD in the beginning in response to um, environmental factors um, and sometimes, you know, um, points in life can kind of trigger that as well. Like there are a couple of clusters when we see people who are... Um, entering puberty and then we see another cluster later in adolescent years like 17 plus we see those two kind of clusters of age of onset so either physically developmentally there are some there's some stuff going on or environmentally um, and really understanding that because what what we sometimes see is OCD actually acts as a symptom of what's going on underneath and so it does sometimes um it is worthwhile going back to the start and figuring out what that is and helping the person learn to understand that and cope with it, but then also learn how learn more adaptive and healthy ways of regulating their emotions so they're not relying on rituals and compulsions. Great. Thanks for that. So, Scott, do you have anything to add to what Celine just said? Well, look, I think... Um, the the origins of OCD remain a little bit shrouded. I mean, we I mean it's the case with all you know uh, psychological psychiatric conditions. I mean, th look, the simplest way of of answering the question is it you know is it biological and uh, or or psychological uh, is yes, it is. It's both. Mm -hmm. um, so let's sort of you know consider that. Um, my sort of view on this really is that. If you have a significant genetic um, component, if you've got a lot of family history, then maybe you don't need very much at all to trigger it off. Um, if you don't have as much, maybe you need more. Um, and the that's, I think, probably the best way to, to, to think about it. Um, yeah, that's probably what I, my, my comment at that point, yeah. All right, thanks for that. Um, there have also been questions asked. I can't think who it was who made the comment about um, being careful not to reassure the patient. I gather that was, uh, must have been you, I think, Celine, saying not just to dismiss the person's concerns. Mm -hmm. Can you just yeah. expand a little bit more on that, what, what, uh, what that point was? 
Yeah, so a really common compulsion in people with OCD is seeking reassurance um, and they might want to seek reassurance for themselves. So they'll spend hours and hours on Google or they'll ask family members for reassurance multiple times. Um, and so as a clinician, one of the things that we want to do in treatment during exposure and response prevention um, is to not feed into that reassurance trap because um, it just it feeds the compulsions and only provides temporary relief. It doesn't provide, doesn't give the client a chance to actually learn how to sit with their distress. So if a client is saying something, for example, um, in Duarte's case, um, like, have I cleaned this enough? For argument's sake, that might be a question. Are you sure that I can stop cleaning this? That might be another question. And so a typical answer will be, well, I don't know, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Let's just try and sit with that doubt and uncertainty and see what happens. As opposed to going, yeah, that's fine. You've cleaned it like five times already. So option A is preferable over option B. Okay, good to know. Um, Steve, if I can make a comment about that. Look, um, th this is where families sort of get pulled in because, and, mm -hmm. and therapists too. I mean, it's really easy to... I mean, Celine just said, you know, oh, we wouldn't, we would never say um, something like that. We would never say that's enough, that's enough. But it is incredibly hard not to do that sometimes. And yeah. and and some patients are very clever, very well clever. They're sneaky. They they can sort of mm -hmm. they'll ask it in one way, and they'll say, oh, and they'll ask it in a slightly different way. Um, but the dilemma we have is that, as Celine sort of hinted, that um, compulsions. Everyone performs compulsions, but the problem with compulsions is that they're not very efficient. Um, and sometimes you do it and you have to do it again and you have to do it again and you have to do it again. And, you know, this is why some people develop, you know, I've got to do everything four times or four times four. Um, but this is also where family comes in too, because they, they do it and they have that uncertain feeling, which... I think what is what Celine was saying before about what they've got to learn to to sort of cope with, um, but they hate it. And I mean, we're all like that. We hate feeling uncertain. We'd love to be, we'd love to have have a guarantee about things. We'd love to know. Yep, this is the situation. Um, mm -hmm. And so, in the end, we have to sort of resort to sneaky little things like saying, "Well, yeah, that could be enough," or hmm, "I'm 99 percent sure that you'll be okay and you won't get cancer." Um, but and you, you might say, well, that's that's being a bit mean. But you know, it, it's but what we're trying to do is get people to stay with that doubt and that uncertainty, and and not scratch it in a sense. My, mm -hmm. One of my favourite sort of analogies or metaphors is it's like a mozzie bite. You get a mozzie bite, and you think, oh, I've got to scratch it. But what you, we know is that eventually we've got to not scratch it and we've just got to let it be there and be painful until it sort of fades. Um, so that's sort of what we're hoping in these situations. Yeah, it does make sense. Look, I don't know how people are going. The uh, uh, the the video is breaking up a little bit. Scott looked briefly like Thanos from the Avengers there for a moment, but he's back with us again. If people are practicing. having... <laughs> yeah, people are having trouble. Uh, I'm sure it will hold together for the rest of the webinar anyway. Look, one thing, Johanna, I'm thinking of you. The, the, one of the major roles for the GP is obviously making really good referrals. A few questions have come up about how you find people like Celine and Scott with a particular interest and the expertise uh, in things such as ERP as an approach to OCD. Um, how do you go about uh, finding the right therapist for a particular client? Uh, I think that built over time. I think well, GPs are the uh, kind of we we are based in our place, and so we we work out who our local key referral pathways are, and sometimes we get negative feedback and don't refer again as a result. Um, uh, and so with a little bit of a feedback loop to to guarantee the quality of the people we refer to. Uh, of course, there's times where we actually don't know um, of somebody new in our neighbourhood and that's where we have to also go searching and ask our colleagues for who they would recommend in this space. Uh, mm. And often patients will bring to me somebody they've heard through word of mouth and that also introduces me to someone with some skills I don't know. Yeah, so you build your, build your network that way. That makes a lot of sense. Look, I'm just picking up on a question which has come up from a couple of people, uh, which goes back, I guess, to this question about 
enabling behaviours. I mean, we obviously don't want enabling behaviours from the uh, the treating clinicians, but again, from family. I'm just wondering what sort of words people might use when talking to families who are obviously living this experience with their family member, their loved one. What what words can you give them to help them um, not enable these these behaviours? It, I think. Okay, probably, can I? Go on. Uh, <laughs> I think was first first out of the box. Um, oh, I'll make mine quick. The things we often teach our family members is validate what your loved one is going through, and then convey confidence in their ability to cope with what they're going through. So you're being a coach and a cheerleader on the side rather than getting pulled in. And as Scott mentioned, remembering you are human, it's never going to be perfect. It's a learning, it's a learnt skill. All of this is, even, even as clinicians. Um, but if you can remember those three things, validate their emotional experience and convey confidence in their ability to cope, you can think of phrases that will be able to help your loved one get through that moment. Mm, great. Mm. All right. Thank you for I, that. I would add to that the idea that we're wanting them to feel safe enough to feel. Yeah. Uh, and so that's not safe as in molly coddled and reassured all the time. It's safe as in safe enough to try something new and take appropriate risks. Uh, and so that kind of framework that your the overarching goal is to help them to feel like they can cope with what they know, with the images that come into their mind, with the thoughts and feelings that they experience, and that you're with them on the journey as they ride that wave uh, mm -hmm. is part of how we would do that. It must be difficult living in that environment. In fact, um, Janice has asked a question about um, her uh, dissonance, I guess she sees, in how people can be so obsessive about some aspects of cleanliness, uh, germs on cupboard handles and things like that, uh, and yet uh, you know, not change the bed for a year, bags of rubbish. There can be some sort of um, incongruities in the way people are interacting with their environment. Any thoughts about that and how that it might help resolve that. Mm. Well, I was going God, to say, I think it's um, good, yeah, okay, mm. um, yeah. Look, Steve. Some, in some cases, people with OCD have they they sort of compartmentalise how their OCD affects them. So they keep certain areas sort of free of it, um, mm -hmm. but in 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 the area where it involves them, um, it it really takes over. Um, and so you can have people who's, who have an area in the house, for example, that is perfectly clean um, and the rest of the place is, is, is full of junk, for example. Um, and you can have someone who's very pedantic in one circumstance about washing or checking, um, but you know, make, has to, in a sense, almost make an excuse in another one. Um, and it's one of the, I mean, what we were talking about before, I think, um, Sometimes for family, you need to do a little tutorial, I guess, on how OCD works. Um, and you might need to explain to them how reassurance sort of acts as a, as a compulsion. Um, but you might also need to explain to them that, that this sort of inconsistency is pretty much pathognomonic of OCD. So, and you can get people who are, who are absolutely pedantic about one circumstance and often might relate to a family member. Um, and yet they break that rule themselves, you know, a minute later. And that may, family just scratch their head about this. They just, you know, they, they mm -hmm. struggle to, to sort of get their head around that. How can you do that in this situation and not in that? Um, and, and again, that's, there's, there's probably some coaching and, and discussion with family members mm -hmm. about that to sort of help them tolerate it. Sometimes it's incredibly difficult. Um, mm -hmm. and family members feel like they almost have to choose between, you know, do I accommodate this person um, or do I resist uh, what they want me to do all the time, which inevitably leads to a, often, well, often leads to a lot of conflict. Mm. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. I'm just wondering, uh, I, again, I should warn people that the storm is really getting serious here, but we are holding in there. Um, as the thunder crackles in the background, this is actually a pretty impressive effect. I might do this more often. <laughs> uh, look, while 
while we have the satellite, um, there are a number of questions coming up. I'm going to actually ask Scott while we've got you, Scott. You you, you mentioned that you might come to this, but it's um, newer approaches, I guess, or almost experimental approaches. There have been a couple of questions asked about transcranial magnetic stimulation and deep brain mm -hmm. stimulation. Can you talk just a little bit about that? I must say I haven't heard about those in my neck of the woods. Sure, sure. Um, look, what what we've talked about is, I mean, the essence of treatment is still explanation, um, a, a CBT method, primarily exposure, um, with some often with some ACT ideas and medication plus or minus. Um, TMS is a is a technique that's been developed in the last twenty years, um, and I'm not going to try and explain it fully because I don't even understand it myself fully, but essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's a large magnet that is placed next to the person's head and it's turned on and it changes there's a magnetic field within the magnet which changes the magnetic field of the neurons in the brain and again I cannot explain how it works but there's some pretty good evidence that it works in depression um, and it's been used a lot and it's been rolled out a countrywide really in the, in the last five ten years um, pretty much every private psych hospital and a lot of public ones have them now. The evidence in depression is good. The evidence in OCD is really patchy. Um, there's research being done particularly in Melbourne by Paul Fitzgerald's group at, at uh, in Camberwell. But mm -hmm. the research is, um, I mean, I've referred probably 20 people for TMS for OCD and the, re the results I've seen have not been particularly impressive. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I suspect... If we had Paul Fitzgerald here, he'd say, well, look, that's because we haven't refined it yet. Um, we've still got some hopes, and I think they do still have some hopes. Um, uh, deep brain stimulation is like the end of the line, um, and this is for the squeamish. You should sort of mute at the moment. But um, DBS is um, a treatment that was developed for Parkinson's disease um, and is very effective for Parkinson's. In, essentially what it involves is um, placing electrodes drilling holes in the skull, placing electrodes through the brain matter into a certain part of the brain on both sides, the nucleus accumbens. Um, the electrodes are attached to a, like a pacemaker and that's turned on and those parts of the brain are stimulated repetitively. Um, and there's some evidence that that works in um, a proportion of people with really severe OCD. It's, as you can imagine, it's a really complicated treatment. Um, it's expensive. Um, it's done fairly infrequently. It's a last resort treatment, um, and it works probably for about 50% of the people who have it. Um, and for some of those, it's absolutely re you know you know a revelation. Um, it's not so good when when you, when you talk to the other 50% who aren't getting better, and who've had what what is seen as like the the, the most important treatment around. But um, so look, that that's really a last resort treatment. It's 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 a there's potential for it, um, but it's never going to be a mass treatment. I think at the moment the Royal Melbourne is, has funds to do two operations per year, so it's um, going to be always infrequent. Oh, that's extraordinary. Thanks for the update on that. It sounds uh, hair-raising, as you say. There's also been a number of questions, including before the webinar, about people who are neurodivergent or autistic spectrum disorder uh, having an intellectual disability and um, whether there are any thoughts from any of the team about whether the approach might be different when you're dealing with somebody with those uh, coexisting conditions, children, adults. I guess the appro the approach in terms of the form of treatment isn't different, but the way we deliver the treatment differs. So for people who are um, diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder, for example, um, we have to first pick apart compulsions that are that or repetitive behaviours that seem like compulsions but are part of the ASD. And because often they serve a function of helping to regulate and self-soothe um, and are not bothersome. And then look at um, what constitutes um, intrusive thoughts and OC more typical OCD-like behaviours because you will see that. And a lot of the time, either the young person or the adult will tell you, um, I don't want to be experiencing these thoughts. And one of the functions of intrusive thoughts is that they are inconsistent with one's values and beliefs, with um, 
we call that being ego dystonic, which is exactly what that means, being inconsistent with one's values and beliefs. And so we have to, through the assessment process, really carefully tease that apart and then modify how we deliver the treatment, um, whether there are any special interests or whatnot from an ASD perspective, using that, um, uh, modifying the language, um, using a lot of games and that kind of stuff with young people, working more with parents, um, with young people as well, so getting more, um, parents involved a lot more um, and so on and so forth. So we still use ERP, but we just modify the delivery. While you're mentioning ERP, there have been a couple of questions about further training in ERP. Where might people go or what would be sort of a good approach to upskilling in that area? Am I allowed to plug my training? <laughs> <laughs> Naughty. We're, not, we're not on the ABC, so I can go for it. <laughs> um, I do a lot of training for professionals. Um, also have a book um, to help people learn more about treating OCD. But there's so much out there. Like there's a lot of overseas providers. Um, I know Ellie Leibowitz, who works from Yale University, works a lot with, he's got a wonderful program at the moment. Um, that teaches um, uh, clinicians how to work with parents, especially when young people are refusing treatment and it's got really wonderful results. So the young person doesn't actually have to be going through ERP. It's working with parents to reduce family accommodation and it's got really wonderful results in achieving outcomes. Um, and helping the young person reduce their symptoms of OCD as well. And also through that process, encouraging them to actually engage in treatment. So he's got a lot of um, workshops that are going at the moment. Um, and there's a lot of other training around as well. Yeah, yeah. All right, so it's certainly worth looking for. There's plenty of opportunities by the sound of it. Yeah. Talking just a moment ago about younger people, and there've been a number of questions about older people with OCD. And um, Joanna, I think, a question or comment was made earlier. It might have been Scott actually, but I think a comment was made about um, that older people tend to experience their OCD symptoms more in the um, more in the head rather than being visible behaviours. Yeah, I think my assumption there is that they've got better and make it le making it less intrusive on other people and less obvious, mm -hmm. uh, and they manage it more with uh, mental processes. Um, that that would be my way of seeing that um, that mentioned that Scott mentioned the comment he made. It, what would you add, Scott? Um, look, I think most people with OCD are quite embarrassed by it, and mm -hmm. they will do almost anything to to hide it. Um, and in fact, if you see someone doing um, obvious OCD behaviours in public, you know they are really sick. And they are really, really mm -hmm. struggling because they've lost that ability to sort of, sort of, you know, control it, manage it. Um, and I think you're right, Joanna. Part of this is is trying to do it more in here, so it's less visible externally. And and I think um, I don't know if there's been a lot of studies on this, but it does seem to that as people get a bit older, they 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 sort of learn, I suppose, to do that, um, and and their rituals become more ones of sort of internal analysis of the situation. So, I mean, I remember I had a patient um, who would, his fear was that he would hit someone driving home um, on the road when he went, went home every night. So he would drive home um, and he wouldn't drive around in circles, which they often do, but he would get home and sit in his garage for as long as it took to mentally try and review the whole trip so he tried to have, get a mental image in his head, like a video of the whole trip, in order to, you know, tell himself, reassure himself, essentially, that he hadn't hit anyone. Um, and you can imagine how difficult that would be, uh, particularly if it was a very long drive, which in his case it was. Um, so yeah, I think that's, um, I th and you know, there's all sorts of little subtleties that people will do. You know, when they check a door, for example, they can, they can mm -hmm. sort of listen to it. They can you know, look at the door jam, they can sort of, you know, um, they don't have to actually touch it at all. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, I think as people get older, they, they get they get um, better at that and in some ways a bit, mm -hmm. in, some, in some cases, a bit sneakier at that too. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would see a lot of these um, compulsions as sort of sophisticated ways to try and calm yourself down. Um, mm-hmm. And often for very clever people who are who are troubled by something that's partly because they're such, uh, they're so capable of seeing um, bad things happening in their minds uh, and thinking of multiple options of what might go wrong. Uh, and so the idea that they're trying to work out a sophisticated way to manage a, uh, an experience they're having on the inside that's not going to bother other people, um, whether it's counting or, or um, you know, thinking thoughts in a certain order or uh, looking for patterns in on the wall or, or images around them. Um, these these kinds of things. For me, I, I just see these people as they're, they're, they're trying to cope with something uh, and they're using their amazing minds to, to try and solve that problem. Um, and then perhaps their bodies actually could become their friends, uh, that their bodies could help them to know that they're in a safe place with safe people around them. Uh, and that their sensations could be broadened. So in the person who's in the house where they're not noticing the rubbish and the dirty bed, but they are noticing the fleck of dust on something, if we broaden their noticing so they can see the sunlight as well as the clouds outside and smell something and feel the breeze on their their arms and remember Mm -hmm. something their friend gave them last week, and have that wide sense that when we're well, we have this kind of wide sense of noticing our world. Uh, mm-hmm. And this narrowing is part of what's the distress for them. Uh, so I, I guess I would see there's also beautiful, sophisticated ways we can use their amazing minds to connect them back to their bodies. Uh, so their experience in the world is less frightening and narrow in its focus. It looks, Suzanne, in the questions as asked a question relating to somebody whose life's been turned upside down and is exhibiting behaviours, I guess, as a consequence of a major loss of grief. Uh, She's talked about an older person who starts exhibiting overt verbal discussion of a sexual nature shortly after their partner dies and just wondering, you know, how that is can sort of be, um, I was going to say dealt with, but that sounds suppressive or repressive. But I mean, is this sort of an approach before having to go for professional help if somebody's had their their universe rattled in that sort of way. Mm. Yeah, I th- I think that's a tricky one. It's it's a little bit driven by how distressed they are by what's happening and how much it's impacting other people around them. Uh and I, I guess uh, how how amenable they are to shifting the topic off that topic and um, widening it in the moment. Um, but I'm sure there are wiser things that both Celine and Scott could add to that that um, thought from Suzette. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll go hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm not entirely sure what that 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 um, question is about, to be honest. Um, I think it might relate to another case, which is probably going to lead us away from the case we're considering. One thing I did want to talk about, though, was the issue about um, the uh, focus on hand hygiene uh, as a result Mm. of the pandemic, with uh, here in Victoria, everybody heading back into the shops, uh, kids back at school, heaven for fend, even um, students on university campuses again. How do we recognize? Oh, what's become this uh, sort of government mandated focus on hand washing with people who were trying to um, ride their their compulsions to hand wash? Mm. It's it's quite an issue actually. Um, mm-hmm. We had a young woman did a hospital program recently who had the classic sort of you know reddened hands and and really I mean you just look at them and you feel you can feel her pain really because she mm-hmm. she would have been washing her hands a hundred times a day plus. Look, this is going to be a problem, and it's going to be a problem in in uh, in OCD management for some years, I think, because um, you know there are going to be a lot of people washing their hands a lot and using you know nasty sort of um, uh, chemicals like bleach and the like as well. Um, the interesting mm-hmm. thing I've found is that many of the people who are washing their hands a lot um, actually are not so much concerned about contamination well I guess they are they're, but they're mainly concerned that they're going to get COVID and give it to someone else 
So actually, yeah. this is more an issue with harm rather than with contamination, because they're not so concerned mm -hmm. themselves about getting COVID, um, but uh, they're certainly concerned about about giving it to others. The interesting thing, I'll let Celine have a have a word in a sec. The interesting thing is that last year, a lot of my patients who were hand washers um, didn't actually wash their hands any more than they than 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 usual, because they basically said, "Look, that's not my OCD." Um, and they were able to stick to the rules pretty well. And I think they'll be generally okay. Um, so the ones that I've seen have, who've had problems have been more people with harm issues and, and maybe who didn't have significant contamination stuff before. Celine? Oh, yeah, totally agree. A lot of um, my clients have also been saying the same sort of thing. They're more worried about making other people sick, so it's triggering a sense of responsibility, which ties into that harm. Um, but also one of the things I often, you know, and a lot of clients um, definitely last year were like, I'm being told to do things I'm trying not to do. What is going on? And I think the most disconcerting thing as an OCD therapist is having to stop your clinic with Glen 20 and uh, all this other stuff. Um, and I, I, it almost felt like karma for the last decade or so of making people mm. resist the urge to not have to wash their hands and stuff but anyway I'm digressing mm. um absolutely one of the things that I often tell my clients especially if it is relevant for them and they are struggling is to not do the extra because if there's anything we know about compulsions once is never enough there's always this really strong urge to keep going until it either feels right or the pattern is complete or whatever that looks like for that client and so the client will still have to sit with some form of urge because they'll wash their hands once and they'll want to keep going often or they'll want to complete the pattern. And so I often say to my clients, follow the guideline, but don't do the extra um, and then sit with the urge to want to do more, knowing that you can't because you've, you've done what, what the guideline is recommended by um, our higher powers. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Thank you all very much. We're moving into the summing up phase now, but before we do, I think that we've probably had the comment of the night from Dr. Norman Shum, who seems to have captured the whole mental health professional network concept by saying that in my clinical practice, I've found that the stronger the therapeutic relationship, the better the outcome, almost no matter which strategy or approach I apply. So, I mean, that's always been my view as a GP, that it's the operator as much as the technique in many, many cases, not dismissing the importance of good technique. I can see you nodding there, Celine. What are, what are people's thoughts on that comment before we move to the summations? Absolutely. That is, like, in ERP, trust is so important because you're asking people, first of all, ERP is a very counterintuitive treatment to what we would normally do with our clients who present with general anxiety or other types of anxiety disorders and other conditions. So that level of trust is, and rapport that you have with your client is first and foremost the most important thing. Um, I think that's a really wonderful comment and wholeheartedly agree. And if we look at, um, I think it's Walpole's research, um, who talks about that relation, the one key thing that is the most important predictor for success is therapeutic relationships. So 100% agree with that, yeah. Great. All right. Well, thanks for that. Let's now... I agree with in. half of it. Yeah, I wasn't <laughs> asking you. I agree right. with the first part and not so much the second part. I think, okay, I think the, the therapeutic relationship is vital, um, but, well, you, you're not going to get a great response to OCD by doing psychoanalytic psychotherapy for example yeah. um yeah. so you know there, there has to be a there has to be some focus on the specific uh yeah. in that context so the careful choice of technique but it's not going to work if that relationship's not there i suppose yeah, yeah. If, if, so i'd have to say as a gp pills work a whole lot better if the, if the person providing them is trusted yes for sure. yeah think, too late in the evening to be throwing these things around. So let's hear from each of you. Uh, we'll start with you, Scott, with your uh, reflections and summary, I guess, of what we've talked about tonight from your perspective. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, look, it's it's great to be here to talk about this. Um, OCD has been something I've worked um, in for a long, long time. Um, and look, I think we're getting better. Um, when I started, um, I, you know, I think there were so many people with OCD who were coming in 
um, having had the problem for 10, 20 years or more. Um, we're still seeing those people, but we're seeing a lot of people now coming in in their late teens, early 20s, um, with you know much earlier. So the, the, the understanding of it's better, um, and I think we're doing better as well. Um, so the, the comment that someone asked about before as to how to get training in it is complicated because there aren't a whole lot of you know specific training programs. Um, I'd have to say that I learnt a lot of my um, uh, understanding of how OCD works and ERP understanding from reading self-help books. And there's a couple of fantastic self-help books. I think I put a, I've given a couple of links to some of them, to two of them. Um, the other thing that's worth thinking about is um, you just got to talk to a lot of people with OCD. That actually is a big issue, um, and just trying to understand how it works for them. Um, and if you're interested, go to a conference, and but go to a specific conference if you really want to get OCD stuff. Sounds great. Now, talking to people is obviously something you do a lot of. Celine, your reflections on tonight's conversation? Um, I think like it's just so wonderful to be able to do this on such a large scale forum um, because I think, you know, there sadly isn't that much. But as Scott said, it is getting better. Um, and so um, I guess the biggest takeaway from all of this is... Um, to really try and think as holistically as possible in terms of not just from a treatment perspective but also listening to your client as well and making sure that your client is able to walk with you along that treatment journey and to not leave them behind um, and to always make them feel safe enough to know that they're still in control of their treatment and they can still advocate for their needs no matter where they're at so I guess we have to remember to meet meet our clients where they're at in terms of what their needs are. Absolutely. No. Thank you so much for that. And Joanna, the last uh, last words from you, your reflections. Well, I just thank everyone for a lovely conversation, bringing all our points of view. And something I love about MHPN, that we bring our diverse trainings and together we're something better together. Uh, I, I guess I was really struck as we were talking and seeing the chat of the sense of the silent suffering of those with OCD in our community and their families. And um, so I, I guess I, I'm thankful for everyone who's spending time tonight listening and learning uh, for the work they're going to do in each location where they're working or around the country. Um, I also wanted to say, look, I love the way that uh, uh, Scott put it, that these are people with OCD. And the way Celine said, we have to formulate what this whole person's life story and their community and their, uh, their experience overall is. Uh, and so we don't accidentally make the same mistake the patient is of the OCD becoming their focus. Uh, so in each time we care for these people to remember that they're people who've got amazing strengths and who have worked out sophisticated ways of staying safe in the world for themselves and the people they love and uh, that we have a role to help them see that there are possibilities for healing uh, in, in, on that journey. And it's, it's, some of that's up to us to go and get trained. And I'd highly recommend uh, trauma-informed practice in this space because it brings in the idea that life story, relationships, and our embodied experience are part of what impact our mental well-being and our relational well-being. Uh, and so I would see some of the emotion regulation focus we've had in our conversation tonight could be directly attributed to some of the raising of awareness in that area about how our bodies get aroused and our perceptions get distorted and our sense of uh, our sort of arousal in, in our um, altered perception in, of our world uh, can change how we experience our lives. And uh, so those broad skills, could they be used for your range of patients that we include obsessions as one of the ways that they cope, but also addictions and withdrawal and avoidance and all the other ways that people try to cope with being uh, physiologically aroused and distressed in their world. Um, and I've just loved uh, being with the panel tonight. Uh, thanks for having Absolutely. me. What a fabulous way to finish. So thank you so much indeed uh, to our panellists um, and also to a very active group of attendees. Uh, it's amazing how 
connected you do feel through this platform with the people, the thousand people who are watching uh, at home. Um, so please do ensure you complete the exit survey before you log out, either by clicking the pie card pie chart icon in the lower right corner of your screen beside the speech bubble or wait for um, the message to pop up when the webinar ends. Now there will be a statement of attendance issued within four weeks and you'll also get the link to the online resources uh, for the webinar within a few weeks. Um, reminding you about the various other activities coming up, uh, the cultural considerations in um, Social and Emotional Wellbeing of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children and Families, which is 10th of November. Uh, we have Trauma-Informed Care in Older Australians on the 18th of November and Generalised Anxiety Disorder, 6th of December. You can see the podcast uh, program there as well. And uh, if you would like to join in with other professionals at a local level, then please do contact the project officer in your area. There's a map online there at the website. Um, or contact Jackie uh, at uh, the network's email address there. So we're at 8.30 and before I close though, as always, and particularly tonight because we've spoken so much about what it uh, must be like to live with this particular condition, I would like to acknowledge the lived experience of people uh, with the condition and other mental illnesses and the people who care about them uh, in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. So thank you so much to everybody for your participation this evening. I wish you all the best and I hope you have a really good evening and heading into the festive season. I got in first before anybody else. Thank you all very much. Good night. Thanks, Dave. Good Thanks, night. everyone. Thank you.